Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Ventura Center for Spiritual Living. It's great to see you here on this beautiful morning. And we breathe deeply and we allow ourselves to be still and know. To know the voice of spirit that resonates uniquely within each of us as we listen to the words of our sacred reading. From Dying to Be Me by Anita Morjani. Before my death experience, I used to think that the purpose of life was to attain nirvana, that is to evolve beyond the reincarnation cycle of birth and death. But after my near-death experience, I feel differently. I've lost my desire to be anywhere but the place I am now. I've become more grounded and focused on seeing the perfection of life in this moment. I sense that we choose to incarnate into a physical body in order to express love, passion, and the full range of other human emotions not available to us separately in the state of pure awareness and oneness. Life on this planet is the main show, where the action is, and where we chose to be. This reality is a playground of expression. It looks as though we aren't here to learn or gather experiences for the afterlife. There doesn't seem to be much purpose in that because we don't need any of it there. Rather, we're here to experience and evolve this physical universe and our own lives within it. I made my decision to return when I realized that life here was the most desirable state for me at this time. We don't have to wait until we die to experience nirvana. Our true magnificence is right now. And so it is. Ah, so let us just know that our true magnificence is right now, no matter what. No matter what external appearances are tugging at our attention, no matter what internal experiences talking to us. Let us know that this moment is sacred, that this moment is perfect, this moment is here, and we are here now in this perfect moment. And so as we sing together, I am remembering who I am, we deepen in this awareness of the absolute reality of the all good that infuses every single moment and every single being. We know it for ourselves, we know it for the people sitting in this sanctuary, and most of all, we know it for the entire universe. I am remembering who I am. I am is the name of God. Let us sing. And in this beautiful spaciousness, we remember the truth of our being, of all existence, that God is all in all. And so we bring this awareness into the room as we breathe in deeply and then exhale, opening our eyes in love with what is as it is and so it is.
so we have uh, a special treat this morning uh, because it's, we're in the process of Passover. We have somebody who's going to speak with us about Passover. So let's give a lot of Ventura love to Ms. Jonna Shane. Is that good? Does that work? Good morning, everyone. Happy Pesach and happy Passover. Passover is a very joyous and holy celebration of freedom. It commemorates the exodus of oppression of the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt. The Hebrews cried out to God because they wanted their freedom. So God sent Moses to set the people free. But the Pharaoh wouldn't allow it. So God struck 10 plagues onto the Egyptians. And they are, I have to use my fingers. The first it began with um, turning the river into blood and then the frogs, then lice, and the beasts, and pestilence. The, the locusts and the darkness. I'm missing something, so I'm going to look. Hail, very good, hail. <laughs> and the last, the worst of all, was the, um, the killing of the firstborn sons. So, um, but God told Moses that if he, um, if he told the Hebrews to sacrifice the Paschal lamb and take the blood from the lamb and put it on their doorposts and on the frames of their homes, that the angel of death would pass over the homes and their children would be saved. And that's how we got Passover. And so... Oh my gosh, normally the, the traditional way of celebrating Passover is with a Seder dinner and you read from the Haggadah and it's a, it's a very uh, long drawn out affair because you read the, the whole story of what took place and how, we, how the people were relieved from bondage and um, uh, there's a Seder plate in the middle of the table and on it are all the commemorations of what uh, everything means. There's a bowl of salt water that represents the tears of the Hebrews that they cried. There's um, a bowl with some bitter herbs, which represents all the bitterness that they went through. There's the little uh, shank bone from the lamb, which represents the Paschal lamb. And also there's um, a horseradish root usually, and that represents the bitterness of all the struggles and then there's a roasted egg <laughs> and that represents spring and freedom and the newness of beginnings and so then comes the wine there's lots of wine that you partake in <laughs> and four cups actually and they represent um, freedom redemption deliverance and release and so on the fourth cup um, everyone dips their pinky ten times to represent the ten plagues and remember that they struggled too. Wine is for our enjoyment and our indulgence, but we give back to the earth and remember that others struggled for our freedom as well. And, you know, the Jewish people, no matter what, believed in one nation under God, no matter what their faith there is only one God, and we are all one. And on Passover, we remember our freedom, not from slavery, not just from slavery in Egypt, but from our own inner struggles, our own bondage, and from forces outside of ourselves. But we release our struggles, and we remember the struggles of others. That's the most important thing. So I celebrate with you the miracle of Passover, and I wish you shalom and joy, and may Adonai be with you and bless you forevermore. You. Something about hearing Hebrew, I mean, all she said was Adonai. Something about he hearing Hebrew in church just makes me get emotional. <laughs> My mom used to tell me I was Jewish in a former life. Maybe that's it. <laughs> Good. 
be, who knows. Mm. But I'm very grateful for, for Jana, who is so willing for some of the Jewish holidays to come up here and, and speak. It feels to me like it's, um, it's an act of respect for me to turn that task over to someone who was raised in the tradition, um, because there's, there's such a depth to hearing her speak it versus hearing me speak those words. So once again, Jana, thank you so much, and I appreciate that. It's good to speak. <laughs> mm. Another another person that I turn to to assist me with um, with things related to the Jewish tradition is Rachel Naomi Remen. A lot of you have read her books. We've featured one of her books now. She wrote a wonderful book called My Grandfather's Blessing, which I'll be quoting later today. Uh, Rachel Remen was a, a Jewish woman born to atheists, but fortunately for her, because she was a mystic inside, her grandfather was a Kabbalah Kabbalistic rabbi. And he, um, he taught her a lot about Jewish mysticism, so I may share a bit of that today. But mainly what I'm speaking about today is from my own science of mind sensibilities, from the teachings of this, um, this teaching, this faith that we belong to here, which is religious science or science of mind or centers for spiritual living. It goes by many names. But the main gist of it is that, is that a lot of what happens in the Bible or in our lives is allegorical, and they're teaching stories, as above, so below. That what happens in the word of God happens in our word as well. So there's a couple of things I want to keep you, have you keep in mind as you're listening to this message today. The first one is, you know, you noticed in the story that Jonah told that God does a lot of really bad stuff, right? <laughs> you know, he's killing firstborns and then the poor lamb gets killed. Don't tell our farm animal, animal petting zoo person for Christmas, you know? And there's plagues and locusts and boils and all that stuff. And all those Egyptians, you know, you've seen the movie, right? They all get drowned in the Red Sea and they're just following orders, right? My friend Mark would say, says to his congregation, he's a minister as well, he says to his folks, welcome to psycho God. <laughs> now God is merely a projection of what we, or the way we interpret God is, is largely through our projection, through the images that we cast onto God. And what I'm, one thing that I'm fond of saying that I, I would love it if you would keep in mind as you are uh, listening to the words today is that God is not a person. God is a process, okay? That's how we get ourselves in trouble sometimes is that we think that God is a person. But really, God is a process. We learned a lot about the process of God when we did the nature series a few, a few weeks back. We learned that God is the process that can turn a rotting tree into beautiful, rich soil that gives us wonderful fruits and vegetables. God is the process that pulls the tides back and forth, that can take a broken, piece of broken glass and turn it into something cherished and beautiful. God is the process that knows how to turn a caterpillar into a butterfly. Who does that? That is amazing. That is God. So I've told you before that I worship at the Church of Nature, but another church that I worship at is the Church of Physiology and Science. So there's, this is the third thing to keep in mind. The first is psycho God. The second is God is not a person but a process. And the third is this. In the Church of Physiology, there are these things called negatively charged ions and positively charged ions. These are particles in our, in, everywhere, but I'm, think, I'm talking about the particles in our bodies. And what happens, a lot of movement happens in our bodies. A lot of things happen in our bodies because of an exchange of positive and negative ions. So for example, if I were to wave at you, that is millions upon millions of positive and negative ions crossing a cell membrane to make the action happen. It's called an action potential. So keep that in mind, that the positive and the negative are always exchanging. And let's look at that Passover story again. If I were to talk about the Passover story in terms of positive and negative, I might say, oh, Pharaoh was born and he enslaved all the Hebrews. That's a negative. But then, look, Moses comes, Moses arrives. He's saved by Pharaoh's daughter. That's a positive. Moses kills a, a, an Egyptian and gets, goes into exile. That's a negative. But wait. While Moses is in exile, the burning bush approaches him and says, Moses, you are to go back to Egypt and set my people free. That's a positive. But then Moses says, are you kidding me, God? Are you freaking kidding me, God? It's in the Bible. I read it. He says, there's no way I can do that. I'm not good at public speaking. 
<laughs> That's a negative. <laughs> Don't I know it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> then God says to Moses, no, no, I will help you. I'll send your brother Aaron. Aaron and Moses go to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's heart is hardened by God. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Perhaps a negative. God says, I'm not taking that from you, Pharaoh. I'm going to send you a whole bunch of plagues to smarten you up. Right? Again, direct quote from the Bible. <laughs> it's a positive. <laughs> so you see, it goes back and forth and back and forth like that, reaching to, a, to some type of a destination, kind of like the action of a nerve cell. And because we treat the Bible largely as allegory, meaning that it's a story about all of us, what's the allegory here? Okay, we're born. We're born into innocence. Look at the picture of innocence over there. Exhibit A. <laughs> right? We're born into innocence. But then as we get a little bit older, we start to learn about the world. And just through the nature of necessity, we start to develop this thing called an ego, which believes in separation and starts creating limiting thoughts. So we're born into innocence, positive. We create an, an ego, negative. But then because we have an ego, we are somehow creating consequences all the time. Some of us might even call them plagues that rain down upon us. And those plagues wake us up, a positive, a positive. We say, wait, wait a minute, something can be better, something can be, can be different. Maybe we attend a church like this, or we read a great book, or we talk to a friend. I don't have to be this way. A positive, right? But then, oh, the ego gets wind of that and says, are you kidding me? <laughs> right? But we rise above that and decide to do something different, and we make changes in our lives. And this cycle of negative-positive, negative-positive goes on and on and on and on, never ending, always. And it's what makes life go forward. Now, for, mo for a moment here, I'd like us to pause, because, because someone's calling, <laughs> and <laughs> I really need to know who it is and speak with them. <laughs> I love the timing of cell phones, I really do. Uh, it, it, it's in, evidently, it's in Dave's purse. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. What are, <laughs> so, Jonna, is that yours? It's God. Yes, yeah, so you helped more than you know. See how helpful you are? That's awesome. <laughs> Anyway, we were pausing to turn within in this, in this sea of positive and negative and look where we might be caught in a negative and calling it a feeling of being enslaved or entrapped. Are we being, feeling like we're enslaved or trapped by something? Maybe it's a condition in our life that feels insurmountable. Or maybe it's our opinion about that condition in our, in our life. Maybe we're afraid of something, or maybe it's an inner condition like doubt, or, or like I said, fear, or worry, or something like feeling like we're inadequate or un unworthy. I just wrote a, a blog that some of you commented on about the feeling, the awful feeling of feeling like a disappointment or feeling like a failure, right? Maybe we're enslaved by that, but we don't have to be. We don't have to be. Remember, there's always this exchange of positive-negative, positive-negative, and everything that we're calling a negative is ultimately leading to a positive, which again leads us to another negative, but we just keep growing in ever-expanding cycles. That's all. Before we move on, though, in terms of how to free ourselves from that, actually this is part of the way to how to free ourselves from that, it is to look at what I call the mother of all enslavement. Okay. If I were to retell that story, the Passover story, the Passover allegory, or the Passover history, whichever, you want to, whichever way you want to look at it, if I were to retell that story from the point of view of Pharaoh, it would be very different. Pharaoh would say, yay, I'm born, and I have all this privilege. I have all these slaves that will do my bidding. Wow, that's a positive. <laughs> and then Moses is born, and Pharaoh goes, uh-oh, this guy's trouble. <laughs> That's a negative. But fortunately, again, from Pharaoh's point of view, Moses messes up and he kills someone and he goes in exile and Pharaoh goes, oh, wow, thank you, we're back to positive again. But then Moses comes back and Pharaoh goes, oh, no, he's back. Oh, no. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I won't, you know the rest of the story, right? So just think about that for a moment and, and consider which story, you know, obviously I, I have a bias, I'm kind of on Moses' side, really, 
you know. <laughs> Probably most of us are. But if we look at it from a broader perspective, which story is reality? Which story is true? They're both true in their own way, but both stories are not the whole truth. And that is what I think is the mother of all enslavement, the mother of all bondage, the mother of all entrapment, is our very sweet, poignant, tender human tendency to have a perspective or a perception or opinion about something and say, this is the absolute truth. Am I right? <laughs> has, <laughs> thank you. Has anyone here ever done that? <laughs> right? <laughs> Good, I'm glad Jill is pure. <laughs> let, us, let us kneel at our feet, or her feet, and worship her. <laughs> okay, right? The idea of making our opinion, our perception, our perspective absolute truth when it really isn't. Right? You know, I'll give you just a brief example of something, that, and this is like a ridiculous example. I don't know why this came to me, but, well, probably because I'm still trying to learn it. But anyway, this happened a long time ago when I worked in a corporation, and I, I was a corporate trainer, and I was, uh, had to go to meetings all day long, and I was always writing training material and writing procedures and writing documents for various or parts of the organization. But I was also a resource for a particular group of about 100 people, and they would come to me when they had a question. And I had this, this, this idea, this opinion, that if only these people would stop interrupting me, I could get my work done. These people need to stop interrupting me. <laughs> that was my absolute reality at the time. Now, we'll get back to the transcendence of that, or at least the partial transcendence of that. Before I, do, before I go back there, though, I want to talk a little bit, of, again, about that idea of absolute reality. Absolute reality is the reality that embraces all things. It, it embraces all opinions, all, all facts, all perceptions. It is the source of everything. It is the, the place where... It's Rumi's field. It's the place where there's ideas beyond right doing and wrong doing. There's a place beyond my opinion and your opinion. It's the place where when we lay down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. That's absolute reality. And so in the Passover story, you know, I, I do worry about the, the lamb blood. Don't, don't you a little bit? <laughs> yeah. But I was wondering, you know, when you think of um, the blood of a lamb, that's such a symbol for innocence, isn't it? The lamb is innocence. It's often used as a symbol for innocence. And the Hebrew people were told to put blood, the blood of a lamb, on each side of the doorway and above, above the doorway. And what is a doorway but our entry into the world? So what if when we enter into the world, we step across this threshold of innocence, and we wear that mantle of innocence, and we look at the world with the innocence of the absolute reality, where we know that our opinions are not necessarily facts, where our perceptions are not necessarily the absolute truth, where our projections are merely projections. And we open ourselves up to a greater place through innocence, to a greater place of being, to a greater place of wonder, and a greater place of acceptance of the mystery that is available to us when we stop clinging to our way, to our enslavement, to our way. Does that make sense to you? Good. <laughs> it's a little abstract. And if it does seem a little abstract to you, and, and you're not quite sure how to go about making this happen, then you're in very good company. One of the things that I loved about Rachel Remen's teachings from her grandfather about Passover, I reread the story where she, she talks about her lessons in Passover from him, and he talks about the part where the, the last plague comes and finally Pharaoh's heart softens and he says to the Hebrew people, he tells Moses, you can, you can leave, you can let your people go, you can, you can, go, out of, you can go out of Egypt and be free. And Rachel says to her grandfather, well, that, that was good news, right? Weren't, weren't the Hebrew people so excited? They must have been so happy that their slavery was finally over. And this is where her grandfather deviates from the story that's in the Bible a little bit. He says, you know what? Rachel, Nishuma, whatever he had a pet name for, he said, you know what? They weren't really all that excited at first. Because what happened was they started asking questions. 
well, we're going to go to this place called the Promised Land. Where is it? Do you have a map? You're a man. You're afraid to ask for directions. <laughs> and by the way, on the way, what will we eat? How long will it take to get there? Where will we sleep? And Rachel's grandfather said, you know, the opposite of freedom is, uh, the opposite of, of enslavement is not necessarily freedom. It is often uncertainty. But, <laughs> the good news is that when all of these objections, perhaps they weren't necessarily written down, but when they were conveyed to spirit, to God, to the process known as God, God said, your freedom is so important to me that I will lead you to the promised land myself. I will go before you as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. I remembered, I was just trying not to cry. Something about the ancient words get to me, okay? It's like when, when Jonah says Adonai, and I'm like, Adonai. <laughs> I will go by a cloud by day and a pillar, pillar of fire by night, and I will lead you because your freedom is so important to me. I think the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night is our own inner knowing. God also said that he would feed the Hebrew people. He would provide them manna from heaven. We had a shocking example of this the other day in my home. We were cooking dinner and Hugh had put a, a baked potato in the microwave. <laughs> and he took it out without a pot holder and it was really hot and he went, whoa, and he, he flipped it up and it fell on the ground and splattered all over the kitchen and the floor. And what did the dogs do? Thank you, God, it's a miracle. <laughs> Manna from heaven. <laughs> ah. And thinking about God as the bringer of miracles, the process known of God as the bringer of miracles, it seems so complicated to us, and it seems like, how can that possibly be possible? And, you know, but when I look at my dogs, they're like, how did a potato fall out of the sky? <laughs> this is a miracle. <laughs> And maybe, in, in fact, I'm willing to bet on it, maybe miracles are just as easy for God. We just have to be there, ready to receive, receptive, willing to see them through that, through that lens of innocence, willing to, to say, thank you, God. Willing to get past our own opinions about what things should be and how life should be acting and how others should be behaving and see the miracle that is dropping down right before us. Certainly that's how I overcame that situation that I told you about when I was doing my work at my corporate job and people kept coming into my office to ask me questions and I said, I cannot work with all these interruptions. And so I went within and I consulted the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And I looked within and I asked that indwelling presence of God that wants my freedom so badly that it follows me everywhere. I asked, what should I do about this? And Spirit suggested me an affirmation. And that affirmation was, I welcome all interruptions. I said it. At first, I didn't mean it. <laughs> I welcome all interruptions. <laughs> but bit by bit, it became my truth. Because when I wasn't so rigid and so rejecting of everybody that came in there, you know, I had this belief, all these people coming in here are preventing me from doing my job. Guess what? <laughs> all those people coming in here were my job, are my job. So I got that one down pat, I learned that. <laughs> Not true, I have to relearn it and learn it and learn it almost every day. I have to remind myself that interruptions, whether it's an interruption from another person or something gets in my way of something big that I'm planning, that all interruptions are welcome. I welcome all interruptions and that way 
I can see the gift in them. But it takes stepping back and looking through that mantle of in innocence, through that lens of innocence, recognizing that my opinion is not the absolute truth, that there is a greater opinion available for me, but I gain access to that greater opinion, greater way of being, greater absolute, through my willingness to turn within and consult with the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, and to allow whatever it is that spirit wants to manifest through me, that process known as God, allow that to inform me, and then actually do the work of living it. So that's my lesson in this, and I'm curious about what your lesson is. No need to shout it out right now. <laughs> but I do urge you to look within and be really honest about a place in your life where you may be enslaved, where you may feel enslaved. And look and see if possibly you have an opinion in there that's a little too strong, either something you're calling positive or negative, when really in the world of the absolute, positive is negative and negative is positive. There's no difference. It's all encompassed by a greater process. Look at this opinion that you're calling absolute reality, this per perception or this projection that you're calling absolute reality, and then see if you can open to a bigger picture. Go within, consult with the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, that vital, beautiful place of innocence within you, and see what God has to show you. I guarantee you that through this practice, you will find your promised land because the truth is, you are the promised land. Let's know that together. Let us pray. <clears throat> and so I turn within and I give thanks. Hmm. I give thanks for this gathering together and for the, the open hearts and the wonder and the love that brings us to the place of recognizing that there truly is one absolute reality, one all-encompassing process known as God, and that this process, this reality, this love is the stuff that the universe, vast and small, is made of. It is the details, every single detail in our lives. It is the thoughts. It is the things we call negative and the things we call positive. It is the greatness and the smallness. It is so vast and so wonderful, infinitely vast and infinitely tiny. And what a privilege it is to be alive an awakening in this beautiful place. So here together we unify with the knowing of this reality, of this absolute, and we name it and we claim it and we call it our own because it is who we are. Right here and right now, I know that we are open to seeing where we are enslaved, where our thoughts are keeping us trapped. We are willing to look at our thoughts about our thoughts or our thoughts about our conditions and to recognize that we are holding only a small part of the puzzle. And we look at that small part with the eyes of innocence. We consult that inner fire, that inner cloud. And we allow ourselves to be informed from the inside out, to be formed, to be informed, to be reformed, to absolutely know that God guides us in every step of the way, that we are part of this process known of God, and that our lives are unfolding in perfection and in completion and in wholeness. There is nothing to be healed, only wholeness to be revealed. And so right here, right now, I, together, collectively, we reveal wholeness, not only for ourselves, but for the entire world. We ponder in our hearts any individual, any being, any animal, any inanimate thing that might be struggling, and know the power of God right there. I am grateful. So grateful for our spiritual work together today. So grateful for the gifts of God. So grateful for the transformation that is taking place not only here in our personal lives, but all around the world through our willingness to be together and through our willingness to enter into truth with humility and grace. 
I bless this spiritual center and every single person here today. I bless this teaching as I bless all teachings, all paths to God. Synagogues, churches, temples, mosques, ashrams, I bless all of them. I bless fundamentalists and atheists. I bless everyone, every being, for everyone is a blessing. And with a heart so filled with blessedness and so filled with gratitude and so filled with wonder and love, I say thank you, Spirit, thank you, God, and I release these words into the mystery, and together we say, and so it is. Repeat after me. I am held in spirit's holiness, divinely guided by wisdom, courage, and love. I am always connected. I see God in everything. I create joy on earth as I share my blessings. Thank you for my life. And so it is.